G'day, I'm Paul. So, if you have lots of kids, but you don't really want a people mover, a lot of people are going to these, which is a ute, but with an SUV body on it, and typically they have seven seats as well, and are off-road capable. This is the Mitsubishi Pajero Sport. This one here is the top spec. It's called the GSR. They introduced this trim a little while back, and I thought, Let's have another crack at this, because the last one that we drove was kind of a mid-spec version. Now, this competes with things like the new Ford Everest, the Toyota Fortuna, the Isuzu MU-X. It's priced at just over $62,000, but if that's too expensive, the entire range kicks off at just under forty-five dollars Today, we're going to do a detailed review of this car, including some off-road driving as well. So if you do want to skip ahead to other parts of this review, you can use the time codes on the screen, or if you're on YouTube, you can scroll down and use the chapters below. If you haven't done so already, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so you can find out every single time we drive a very black car. So let's talk exterior. You've got three colors to pick from, and the only one that's gonna cost you money is the pearl white, which is 200 bucks. So pretty reasonable value for money, I reckon. So GSR gets like all the murdered out parts. So you have black Pajero sport lettering and black highlights throughout the car. I reckon they could have gone a bit further with the black and maybe blacked out these chrome elements and the wing mirrors too. That probably would have done the job. Oh, by the way, sorry about all the flies and the noisy stuff in the background. It is summer in Australia, so sweltering heat and annoying flies. Uh, so big Mitsubishi logo just up the top here. I have a camera here for the 360 camera, calling here for that four cylinder diesel engine. I actually think it looks really good in black as well. They've done a, a good job of just giving this a bit of a sinister look there with all those black highlights. Over on the side here, you have a set of full LED headlights with LED daytime running lights. Indicator is housed down the bottom here. Around the side of the car, you have 18 inch alloy wheels and then you have a pretty decent looking tire as well so this should actually perform okay off-road so we'll see how that goes when we do a little bit of light off-roading but black wheel set up there and then also under the skin there you have uh, disc brakes front and rear as well unlike the triton which has drum brakes at the back at the top here you have chrome on top of that wing mirror with an indicator built into there camera on the side there i mentioned this before on our everest review I don't know why they make off-roaders like this with these sort of fairly chintzy side steps because if you hit that with a rock beneath the skin it's probably going to do a fair bit of damage to that so if you are going to be doing any serious off-roading i'd be replacing those with a, the proper set of rock sliders just so you don't do any permanent damage chrome uh, door handles there i think it would have been nice to just have all of this blacked out as well uh, privacy glass roof rails and then whip around to the back up the top there, you have a shark fin aerial. You have a boot-mounted spoiler. Pajero Sport badges down the bottom there. Mitsubishi badge just there. In terms of towing, this has a 3,100 kilogram braked towing capacity. So it's down on the 3,500 kilo that you find in the Everest and also the updated MUX as well. And then partial LED tail lamps as well. So let me know what you reckon about the Pajero Sport. They haven't really changed it a great deal. I should call out at this point that this is technically a 2022 model uh, there is a 2023 coming just after we film this the only change it's going to have to the vehicle that we're testing here today is that it comes with tire pressure monitoring as well so this is virtually what you'll get if you buy a 2023 version of this so let me know what you reckon about the design in the comments section below so we're inside the patch sport let's start off with the key so it has a lock unlock boot on the back it has a mitsubishi logo Never know which way around that's meant to go. There we go, that way. Um, it is a proximity sensing key, so you can leave that in your pocket. Once you're inside, you have a push button start over here. Look, this interior is getting very, very dated now. And, you know, it looked fine when this first came out a long time ago, but it really is starting to feel its age. And look, they, they do price this accordingly, but Mitsubishi is moving up market. And I reckon if they start asking even more money than this for perhaps the next generation it really needs to feel significantly better than this to charge that kind of premium so it's all sort of pretty scratchy plastics uh, across the vehicle aside from this section here which is pretty nice you can rest your knee on that but yeah i think this probably needs a significant update with the next generation and the infotainment system i'll run through that in a second but this is not very good at all uh, in terms of your touch points in the center here that is really nice and soft soft on the door as well how soft is it well we've got our gyrometer we've tested the main surfaces in this cabin if you want to see how this car compares to others that we've tested before have a look at the link in the description below now what about build quality mm, pretty wonky through there the rest of this feels okay though and our door test 
Lots of beeps in this car as well, but the door sounds nice and solid. So let's talk infotainment. Um, it may look like a reasonably sized screen uh, at eight inches, and it's a color touch screen as well with shortcut buttons down the bottom, but it's probably one of the poorest infotainment systems fitted to any car on the market today. It is just very clumsy and slow to use. The voice recognition is totally useless, and I'll show you that in just a second. But um, yeah, I mean, look, navigation is an aftermarket TomTom -tom unit, a little bit tricky to use, pretty slow as well. Yeah, it's just not very impressive. Um, on the radio front, you have AM, FM, digital radio, and that's all plumbed through an eight-speaker sound system. Sound system is okay, nothing special. You do have HDMI input, though, which is kind of different. You can also play video through USB, and um, I, I, I don't know what purpose that would serve, maybe just when the car's stationary or something, but um, there you go, you have that feature anyway. Outside of that, it's all pretty basic in here, there's really nothing else to it. You do have smartphone mirroring though, which is great news, so you have both Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Before I show you that, I'll run you through what I mean here with the voice recognition. I'm going to try ask it to call, um, I'll try ask it to call Sean, who's standing next to me. Please speak after the beep. Call Sean Lander. Could not recognize. Press the speech key and speak again. Telephone. Telephone. Say a telephone number or a voice tag registered name. Call Sean Lander. Could not recognize. Press the speech key and speak again. So you just go in this random cycle uh, of it not being able to recognize anything that you say. So that's pretty disappointing. And this is what Apple CarPlay looks like. So. Yeah, pretty straightforward. Tiny bit laggy as you scroll through the screen there, but it's fine, it sort of does the job. Uh, this is what Android Auto looks like. So full screen integration, similar to Apple CarPlay though, tiny bit laggy as you move through those screens just there. So from an infotainment point of view, this really isn't very good. Head of the driver though, you do have a digital display that um, you can make very minor changes to. That gives you information such as your speedometer, uh, you've got a tachometer in there and a few other sort of trip computer details as well. So let's talk safety tech. You have autonomous emergency braking, you have an auto dimming rear vision mirror, blind spot monitor built into the wing mirror, you have radar cruise control, you have rear cross traffic alert, you have front and rear parking sensors and a 360 camera. You can activate the camera here on the steering wheel, so give that one hit. Camera is very low quality. I mean, I, I can't really even tell what I'm looking at there. It's very low resolution and quite dim as well. And then as I gradually move through the views, I'm not really getting any better clarity there at all. Uh, I'll pop the reverse camera on. Can't even see it's on the suitcase either. So yeah, this needs a much higher quality injection on the camera front. And what about the horn? This is what it sounds like. Moving on to practicality, and we'll start off with your connectivity. So I mentioned before, you've got a HDMI port, two USB ports for uh, your smartphone mirroring and also charging, and a 12 volt outlet as well. In terms of storing your phone, you've got plenty of storage space for it. There is no wireless phone charging, so you just plonk that down there somewhere. What about your cups? So let's start off with the coffee cup. This morning on the way here, I realized that this is just perfect enough to fit your coffee cup. You can get it out without delitting it. In addition to that, it fits your normal bottles in there as well with decent sized teeth to hold them in place. Bottle fits inside the door too without any dramas, but I don't think it'll fit this big bottle. We'll give it a shot. No, it doesn't fit the big bottle, unfortunately. Other storage, you have center console here with a coin tray, pretty reasonably sized. You have storage down here as well, which is pretty reasonably sized too. You have a glove box over here that's good size, and then you have a sunglasses holder up the top as well. On the comfort front, you have dual zone automatic climate control. You also have a blower control for your second and third rows. Down here, you have heated seats for your front two seats. Sorry about the flies. And then in terms of seat adjustment, both the driver and front passenger are electrically adjustable. So you can go forwards, backwards. Your backrest can go forwards, backwards. You can lift the front of the seat back of the seat you also have lumbar adjustment as well seats are super comfy too they just hug you in really nicely on the steering front you have both tilt and reach adjustment and on our reach test all of this stuff is easy to reach while you're driving so second row of the Pajero Sport um, look knee room is okay but not amazing toe room's not very good at all and headroom is okay but not amazing as well 
I'm actually sitting really high up here. It's kind of got like a stadium seating thing, so you can see down the front there. So perhaps they they could have brought it down just a little bit more to give you a bit more headroom there. Um, anyway, uh, you have map pockets back here. You also have, which I love here, an actual power socket, uh, 220 volt, 150 watt. You then have two USB charging ports, air vents up the top here. Center armrest here with a pair of cup holders. We'll see how that fits our bottle. No dramas at all. You can also pop this one inside the door as well if you want. Fitting kids in here. So you have two ISO fix points on the outboard seats. You then have three top tether points here. You do have to construct your own seat belt though for the center seat here, which I just find really strange. But anyway, it is what it is. Uh, and finally, our window test. So it's Manual up and down, doesn't quite go all the way down. So third row of Pajero Sport, can you fit adults in there? It's a little bit mismatched because it's a 60-40 split folding seat, but the 60 side is on uh, this side, so it kind of takes up a little bit of room, but it's basically roll it forward, it then tumbles out of place. And then let's see how much room we got back here. Clip that into position lift that up as well it's actually a surprising amount of room here so headroom is not very good at all my head is sort of wedged into the ceiling there but knee room is surprisingly good toe room is fairly limited but i think if i had to sit back here it'd be perfectly comfortable so two cup holders over here and a 12 volt outlet i also have uh air vents up here as well to keep me cool so look this is actually better than i thought it was going to be i didn't think it would um it would be spacious, but I also thought it would be much, much worse than this. So I have a feeling there's not going to be much boot room though, because it does look pretty small back there. So let's go see exactly how much you can actually fit in the back of this. So let's talk cargo space. You've got a powered tailgate. Wait for that to pop up. Well, that is very low. <laughs> You're going to have to duck down to get into there. Um, in this space here, you have... Just over 130 litres worth of cargo volume, which isn't a great deal, but you do have this little hidey hole down the bottom here, including your little lever there to get your spare tyre down and two hooks off to the side. Really can't fit much back there. Uh, to get this down, it's quite an interesting system. So instead of just dropping this, because it kind of just sits there like that, you have to first drop the base of the seat, which flips up and out of the way and then you drop the top. So you have that kind of awkward arrangement there. But when you do drop all of that out of the way, you have just over 500 litres of cargo space. I'll show you what that looks like with our bags in there. It all sort of fits in perfectly fine. If you do then want to expand the space even more, you've got to drop the second row manually from the sides. You come around here to do that. And then once that is dropped, you have a space of just under 1,500 litres on a fairly flat load floor. Righto, we've hit the road in the Pajero Sport. Uh, let's kick off with the engine. Look, it's going to sound familiar if you know the engine in the Triton. It is a 2.4 litre turbocharged diesel engine. It makes 133 kilowatts of power and 430 newton metres of torque. And that's all made it to an eight speed automatic transmission. How does all that feel behind the wheel? Yeah, look, it's actually, yeah, it's it's interesting because we've driven the Everest now a fair bit and that's 500 newton meters of torque, but the Everest is pretty heavy and this isn't quite as heavy as the Everest. And that means that it does still feel pretty peppy in a straight line. Uh, if you're kind of the only person in the car, if you are towing and you have a family on board, it is considerably slower. It does feel sort of fairly um, heavy out on the road, especially when you're, waiting for it to kick down gears and sort of make its mind up. The gearbox is pretty decent. It can hunt a little bit at times, but for the most part, it does a good enough job of leaning on its torque band, getting things up and moving. 
Probably one of the biggest things I like about this uh, particular vehicle is the ability to switch between two-wheel drive high range and four-wheel drive high range on sealed surfaces. Typically with these ute-based SUVs, you can't switch between two-wheel drive and four-wheel drive unless you're on an unsealed surface. And we go into a bit more detail on that in our four-wheel drive controls video, which you can watch by clicking up here. And, um, uh, and that explains why you can't do that, but this system is called Super Select four-wheel drive. So. Uh, I'll go through the actual four-wheel drive functions once we do go for a bit of light off-roading later on. Righto, let's talk fuel economy. So Mitsubishi claims a combined average of 8 litres per 100 k's. We are currently sitting on... We're currently sitting on 9.8 litres per 100 k's, which I think isn't too bad when you consider the size of this vehicle. So uh, it's it could be much worse is what I'm trying to say. Righto, let's talk about ride. Um, look, the ride is very soft and... Uh, it's, it's good for driving in and around the city because it means you will be comfortable inside the car, but there will be compromises when you are on the rougher stuff. And uh, we're approaching our sine waves now. I'm gonna jack the speed up to 130 just so I can demonstrate what I mean. Because it is ute based, they've ditched leaf springs at the rear, gone with coil springs. And even now as we're approaching our sine waves, it is so floaty and all over the place. I suspect when we do hit this at 130, it is going to be, wow. That is so bad. Yeah, it really is all over the place. It has uh, barely any body control at that top end and it means that it floats and crashes over those continuous undulations. And you're gonna find those become a real problem if you drive out in the country, you're overtaking a long stretch of vehicles, you need to pick your speed up a little bit. 130 is the maximum speed limit in Australia and it struggles at 130 if you hit a bump. You can imagine if you're dialing on a few more k's to overtake, it is really gonna start feeling all over the shop, especially if you are towing. So I'd probably look at an aftermarket suspension kit if you are gonna be doing some serious driving in the country because the standard setup really isn't adequate for a proper country drive. Okay, drive modes. You do have some drive modes here for off-road driving, but we will just leave all that as it is for the moment and go for a punt around our track here to see what it all feels like. It is called a Pajero Sport. It has so much body roll. Yeah, steering isn't overly communicative either, so it's a hydraulically assisted steering rack. Look, they call it the Pajero Sport, but I'm not seeing where they get sport in the name. Um, so, yeah, I'm not even gonna bother pushing any harder than that because it is, it is very sloppy. Yeah, look, ultimately, yes, I understand you're probably not gonna be doing this type of driving um, uh, in, in your Pajero Sport, but we test all these cars the same back to back. When we tested the Everest recently, it is like a Ferrari compared to this through the corners. It really is a, a huge difference. So hopefully with the next generation of this, Mitsubishi really works on the handling and just giving it a better balance between comfort and uh, dynamic capability as well. Lower speed stuff, you have a turning circle of 11 metres, and I mentioned earlier as well, towing capacity of 3,100 kilos with a braked trailer. Let's talk about visibility. So I can clearly see the fronts of the bonnet there. The wing mirrors are nice and big with a blind spot monitor built into them. Visibility out the back isn't too bad, but do keep in mind if you have the third row up, you are gonna have pretty compromised vision out the rear. Uh, and with the poor quality uh, 360 camera, it will make parking this a little bit tricky as well. Now, what about road noise? Uh, it's actually surprisingly pretty good, despite the fact this is sitting on some pretty chunky tires. You don't have anywhere near as much noise from the tires inside the cabin as I thought you would. And that means that if you are doing a country drive on a coarse chip road, it isn't going to infiltrate as much into the cabin. Mitsubishi doesn't have an official zero to 100 times, so I'm just gonna stick it up against our GPS measurement unit and we'll see how it goes. We're gonna go all the way through to 120 as well, just to get our overtaking speed. Uh, there is no sport mode, like I mentioned before, but I'll leave it in two wheel drive high range. If I go to four wheel drive high range, we'll simply lose efficiency through the drive line there. So let's see how it goes. Dial up some revs. Feel the back end lifting there. <laughs> Nail the throttle. Alrighty, feels very leisurely. I think we're gonna run out of space here. Let's see how we go. So there's 90, 100. Of course, it's gonna be close. <laughs> Ooh, we needed a lot of room to get that uh, up to 120. All right, let's see how that went. 11.72 seconds, which is somewhat leisurely. 
80 to 120 in 9.23 seconds. So you just imagine if you are overtaking and you know, you're on a 100k an hour stretch of road and you flick the indicator on at 80k's an hour, it's gonna take you 10 seconds to get up to 120 to overtake, which is just a huge amount of time. And that's just with Igor and I in the car. So you can imagine if the family is loaded into the car here and you're towing, that's going to be exponentially larger as well. So um, that is worth keeping in mind. If you are gonna be doing some serious towing or family hauling, it is probably worth having a look at a V6 in this segment to really give you that leverage that you need. Okay, so it is time to do our 100 to zero break. I'm gonna need a decent old run up here to get to our braking marker. So <laughs> I had to roll onto the throttle pretty early. All right. There's 100. All right, we've got our flashes come on there. Let's have a look at how long that took to pull up from 100 k's an hour. So 46.45 meters uh, in a time of 3.49 seconds. If you do want to see how the Pajero Sport compares to other cars that we've tested before, the link is in the description below. We've only just started doing this test, by the way, so it will take us a little while to start building up that uh, data, but keep an eye on it. And we're going to cap off our measurements with our reverse speed test. So uh, here we go. Once we get up to 45 kilometers an hour. Right, oh, it is time to do a little bit of light off-roading. So I'll run you through the basic specs here on Pajero Sport. Um, it's actually not a bad little setup they've got going here. So in terms of ground clearance, it's just under 220 millimeters. You have an approach angle of 30 degrees and a departure angle of 24.2 degrees. Approach angle is the angle of the face you can approach before you hit anything at the front of the car. The departure angle is the same, but in reverse, you also have a 700 millimeter weighting depth. In terms of your four-wheel drive hard, where I mentioned before, when we were driving on road that you can use two wheel drive high range all the way through to four wheel drive high range with the center differential locked and also four wheel drive low range with the center differential locked. You also have a rear differential lock as well that only works in low range. So, uh, and some driving modes and hill descent control. So we're gonna test all of this out now and see exactly how well it works. Okay, so let's go to our offset mogul. First up, we wanna see how well the traction control works. So I'm gonna leave this in two wheel drive high range and we're just gonna see what the traction control does when we lift a wheel off the ground at the rear, and that's going to be the driver's side rear wheel as we mount this thing. There we go, so I'm just gonna lean on the throttle now and we'll see how well traction control manages this. Lean a little more into that. I can feel that biting and pushing us over. That is seriously good. Wow, that is impressive. I'm gonna kill that parking sensor as well. That's awesome, so we actually just did a massive ute comparison and the triton did really well in that as well and you can go down to the link in the description below if you want to watch that but it looks like they do use the same uh, four-wheel drive system and traction control system between the two so pretty impressive there for pajero sport let's go back over our mogul this time we will go in four-wheel drive high range we flick this over to four-wheel drive high range what we'll do we'll actually lock the center differential as well. What that's gonna do is send 50% of torque to the front axle, 50% of torque to the rear axle, and it will retain traction control as well. So we'll just engage all of that, wait for that to activate. Sometimes it takes a little while here in Mitsubishi products to switch between these four wheel drive modes. There we go, that's finally active and you can see it down there in the corner and it says four wheel drive high range up the top. This is where you can also change between the drive modes. So there's gravel, mud, snow, sand, and rock. We'll just leave it on gravel for the moment. So I'm tipping this should actually do pretty well here because we are sending 50% of torque to the front and the rear. We also have traction control active as well that's gonna manage our wheel slip. So uh, the rear wheel is now off the ground, the front wheel's off the ground. I'm just gonna lean into the throttle and we'll see how well it manages this situation. I can feel that lifting already. Gee, this is seriously good. If I compare this to Everest that we tested here last, um, I actually think this performs better than the Everest in terms of the four-wheel drive system. So really impressed with that. Let's head over to our hill and see how well it does with a bit of climbing. Now it is time to attack our hill here. So tell you how this is gonna work. I'm gonna drop this into low range. We'll also flick the rear diff lock on just for fun. So over to neutral, push this over to four-wheel drive low range. There we go, that's now active. You can see it down there, all the lights are on there because 
disable traction control, your crash mitigation, all that sort of stuff. I'm going to push this button here as well. That's going to engage our rear diff lock. You can see it flashing there. It's not going to activate until we start moving, but that kills uh, ABS as well. So whole purpose of this is for us to, to try climbing it once just on its own. Then what we're going to do is come back around and climb it, but stop in the middle and then take off again just to see how well all of those traction systems work. So rear diff lock is now active. Love that there's paddles here as well. It means that I have full control over everything and can quickly nip through the gears if I need to. All right, not really getting anywhere there, so I'm just gonna try and lean onto the throttle. Yeah, we're not going anywhere, so, hmm, okay. So what I might do is go back down and we'll try just with a tiny bit more pace before I dig too much of a hole in our hill. Massive hole there, we're gonna to have to fix that a little later on. All right, here we go. All right. All right, with a bit more pace, it's fine. All right, we're at the top there. Our mud bog is completely dried out, but <laughs> we made it up. So yeah, just did need a little bit more pace. It got stuck and wasn't sure of itself when we came to a full stop there. So, um, all right, let's kill our rear diff lock here and I want to test out our hill descent control. So for that, I'm gonna flick this over to all drive high range. Wait for that to activate. There it is there. We'll engage hill descent control. We'll engage hill descent control. There it is. So creep over the hill here. Actually, we can use our cameras here to have a the camera is totally useless. It's so dark and the image just makes no sense to me. So it is a little bit pointless there. But anyway, nose, we'll tip it over the edge. It's actually not too bad. It got a little bit of a runaway there, but it all sort of gradually descended without too many dramas there. So that was, that was pretty good. All right, let's head back to our hill and we'll try this one more time. Okay, take two. So I'm gonna pop this back into low range with the rear diff locked. Okay, low range is active. We'll turn the rear diff lock on. Okay, I'm gonna to come to a stop again and um, we'll see if it'll climb. Obviously I've dug a big hole there, so I'm just gonna try stopping a little ahead of the hole. It's about there somewhere. Foot on the brake. I'll just load onto the throttle. Oh, that's better. That is better. Okay, cool, there you go. So take two, it actually worked much better that time. It didn't uh, sit there and bog itself down. So it must've just been like a loose patch that we were on there. So I'm glad it did make it up. Um, just as a reference again with the Ford Everest, Ford Everest couldn't get up there when it came to a stop. It just sat there spinning its wheels. So yeah, pretty impressive there that we were able to climb that without uh, too many dramas. All right, let's have a look at how the Pajero Sport goes over some rocks. So 220 mil ground clearance, it's not a huge amount, uh, but I've left it here in low range uh, and I'm just gonna ride the brake with the throttle and just creep over some of this stuff. This is actually where the soft suspension in Pajero Sport's probably going to come in handy, just because it isn't going to throw us around too much and it is actually pretty comfortable so far. These rocks are <laughs> just all over the shop and when you do fall into some of these holes, it does actually pay to have a super soft suspension setup. And it is worth noting here as well that this is where those rock sliders are gonna come in handy. If you do start bottoming out on those side steps, it really is going to chew them apart pretty quickly. But yeah, look, I'm pretty happy with that. It is very comfortable over here, very manageable and controllable and little fuss as well. So yeah, that's great. So I mentioned before that Pajero Sport has a 700 mil weighting depth and this is where we would go through our river. Um, Fortunately, at the moment, it is so dry. It has been really hot here the past few weeks. And as a result of that, um, there is barely any water in here at all. So this is going to be the weakest water crossing you have ever seen in your life. But I thought, let's just go through it anyway until we figure out a solution here of getting more water into here without it physically falling out of the sky. Um, yes, as discussed. There is barely any water in here at all. <laughs> oh my God. I'm actually fairly certain Eagles M3 could fit through here without any problems. Anyway. 
So Pajero Sport Off-Road, it's actually pretty impressive. It does everything it says on the box, the traction control system works well, and as far as I can tell, it's, it's as capable as something like the new Everest, which I think is a pretty impressive feat for a car that's this old. So the Pajero Sport, look, it is definitely starting to show its age. The interior feels very dated. The engine needs a whole lot more punch, especially if you are gonna be carrying a load and towing stuff and the handling needs a big improvement as well. I'm hoping that with the next generation of this, they can really throw the kitchen sink at it and, and really go to town on it. At the moment though, it's priced at a level where you can kind of get away with those shortcomings because you aren't paying as much as some of the competitors. But if Mitsubishi plans on going premium with the next generation of this, they really need to make sure that it has the contents and the drivability that you'd expect from a vehicle with that price tag. So yeah, look, it's really impressive off-road, but I think probably the engine just lets it down a little bit when it is driven on road with a full load. So let me know in the comments section below, have you bought a Pajero Sport? What's it like to live with? Are they cheap to operate? I'm really keen for your feedback. If you did enjoy this video, please make sure you like it and you share it with your mates. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon. But until next time, take it easy.